Let's talk about glass destruction. So this is the final result that we're looking for. It has essentially two stages. In the first stage, it got, um, the glasses get broken and sucked inward. And then in the second phase, which start around frame 30, um, it transitions into pushing it outwards and like an explosion. So here it's running in real time, like a physically accurate time. Um, but the our vertex animation tool and shaders um, give you the ability to retime it in game. So ultimately, uh, Ben retimed the um, suction part so that it becomes like a more like a slow motion in this part. Then the um, explosive part is accelerated. So let's see how we do this. We start with uh, the original intact glass that we have from the first video that I did. Then uh, create a name attribute based on glass and the uh, um, class index. Um, the reason being that destruction likes to work with name attribute. So let's just get that ready. So the expected look I need is this. Uh, I want the glass to look like it's broken by some kind of magical force and um, not have distinct like bullet-like patterns because um, the RBD material fractures default setup for glass fracture looks like uh, bullet fractures. It has a very distinct um, impact point and there's radial lines and rings of impact coming out of it. So it's, uh, it's not something that's um, suitable for this effect. So we'll talk about how to set up something that's like this. We need to have sort of certain control over the density of fracture we have. We want most of the smaller pieces to be around the center and uh, the bigger pieces to be outside. So it's kind of similar to what we did before. We're gonna generate some impact points like this and feed the impact points into the fourth input of the IBD material fracture. I did two branches again. In the first branch, I started with packing my 12 pieces, so I have 12 pack points. Then I kind of want to generate a point in the center position of individual pieces, and you can do that using uh, extract points. So this is the sort of the center point of all these pieces. And they're not in the same line, which is what I wanted. Then I used a point replicate, um, so generate additional points um, around my current center point and give it, I give it a point jitter so that they move around a bit more, a bit more random. The second method is a bit different. Uh, I want to roughly control the, the global height of um, where I want the most uh, detailed fracture to be. So I put a grid here at, uh, at this height and this grid is quite um, densely divided because I want a lot of points. I uh, put a amount of noise to it, then uh, it dry all points and I deleted most of it. That's, uh, that's how VFX works. You um, put in the hard work, then you delete most of it. Then merging the first branch, then I rate it using minimal distance to the glass. Then do the fracture. Let's cut this. So this is the most important part in terms of getting rid of the bullet pattern look. Let me just set it back to the default value so you can take a look of what it, what it looked like originally. Like bullets everywhere. Um, this is one of the key things, the number of radial lines coming out of the impact point. Typically when you have just three, it's it's good because if you look at this kind of cracks, this kind of normal cracks, it's always almost always three. When you have more than three, it starts to look like, uh, it starts to look a bit either unrealistic or it's like um, this is a 
based on a radial impact point. When you have 20, there's plenty of lines to indicate where the center of the impact is. So let's just bring this down to three. All right, I guess we've just rid of one half of the problem. The other half of the problem is sort of this spider web looking thing. Um, these are the um, radial cracks, the transcentric cracks, um, because we don't have uh, sort of bullet heads. We don't really need this kind of cracks. So we can avoid that by increasing the minimum width of the concentric crack, so they're not like so tightly together. When they are sufficiently big, um, you won't realize these cracks actually. Like they're kind of there sometimes, but you don't really see it. Now the additional thing is um, the edge noise. The edge noise adds more like interesting shape to the edges. You can adjust the noise detail to the get the amount of um, zigzagging you want. Um, I picked this level of zigzagging because it looks appropriate compared to the size of my mesh. Uh, to many zigzagging might not look like glass anymore. Um, in terms of impact points, by default, I think this is on, and this will let the node auto scatter points. I don't want to do that and just um, scatter using the second input. Okay, then chipping is nice. Chipping adds this kind of details to the corners of like the large pieces, and chipping ratio con controls how many of the original pieces that you already fractured will chip. And uh, you can adjust the chipping, uh, the corner ratio and color depth to get the desired look you want. Okay, after that, I cache this geometry and cache the constraint geometry. The next step is to prepare the geometry for ABD simulation. Um, you want the static mesh to have all the static attribute you want before the simulation happens. So one of the static attributes I do want is to somehow create a mask for my interior faces because I want my interior faces in the final version to, to glow. Um, I'm not necessarily necessarily creating the, the vertex color that, that actually glows, but more so um, using, more likely using a vertex color as a, just a separator. So I picked the inside faces and this is a primitive group that includes all the inside faces generated through the fracture. And I assigned to the vertex color of blue. I changed the attribute name from CD to CDV because um, that's the special attribute name the vertex color, the vertex animation node expect. So if we go to the, the VAT node and go to the input tab, this explains the sort of um, attribute you need to prepare if you want to do certain things. So if you want to export static mesh vertex color, you should do um, a vertex color, a vertex attribute indicated by the um, uh, the bracket. Um, and the name of that should be uh, CDV or alpha V. So after I rename it, um, it won't show up in viewport anymore because he didn't especially, um, he didn't is looking for the special attribute of CD um, for rendering in the viewport, but it doesn't matter, the attributes still exist as we want it. Then we do um, RBD config to pack and prep the geometry. It's just a standard default settings. Then um, RBD constraint property in this case. This one allow you to change how the um, glass would behave next to each other. And instead of glue this time, I set it to soft because I wanted to have sort of, I want the glass to look like they are pulled and torn apart from their neighbors. So the constraint, because it's more spring-like, um, it would give me that kind of look. Degrees of freedom, let you decide whether you want to constrain the, um, you want the spring to put a limit on just the position between points or the relative rotation as well. Depends on your look. You can pick whichever version you like. That's just the one I pick. Stiffness, uh, sort of, is like the strength of the force that's applied um, from the spring. So all these you can toggle. Uh, you can play with and see what suits your particular simulation. Now we're pretty much ready 
Um, the other thing we need is to grab the uh, collider that's on the ground, the static version of the collider. We just need the glass to fall on top of them. Now, let's dive inside and see some additional settings I have in here. On the top level, nothing too special. Um, I have an animated gravity that only activate after frame 30. In the, second, in the first phase, I don't want the gravity. So our gravity has a script that just says this. So it will activate um, after frame 30. Ground plane, move that a little bit. That's it. Inside, I have these two things. I have a pop, um, a pop axis force. This is responsible for the first phase and this is responsible for the second phase. Uh, here you can see that um, it sucks it in. It has a suction speed. And behavior here turned off like um, ignore mass because um, I don't want the, the smaller pieces to, to get um, affected more than the bigger pieces to look more realistic. And if you see the wire here, after frame 30, you switch to the right. It doesn't show, but it actually does switch. The script is here. Um, that's the second pop axis, which has a different shape because I want it to be more explosive in the inside. And this one has a suction speed of negative, which basically pushes it apart. And the pop drag, pop, what drag does is that the faster you move, um, the more of a drag force counter to your current movement direction is applied. So it kind of slows you down, like traveling through thick air. But I said the air resistance to the negative, which actually just pushes it further quickly to get that explosive look. That's really it. A little simple switch to a toggle between these two. Then cache the simulation. This part, um, I can talk about this part right now, actually. This part was added later in the second iteration. In the first iteration, this doesn't really exist. But um, you won't see the effect of it uh, on this node. That's why I have this kind of preview branch to see. Essentially, what I'm doing here is there's one piece in my animation, this one. Because the angle of my camera and uh, how it look, looked in the final version, it become it became very distracting. It's a giant piece that's there. So I decided to just shrink it. You can shrink it by animate the P scale, and the P scale can be handled by the vertex animation shader that we have, um, which effectively shrink it any way you want. So we need to create the P scale attribute first, and assign a default attribute for everything else. So all the other pieces have um, the uh, P scale of one and this one I'm going to animate. So this is the piece in question, the number. Okay, so here, um, same number I'm applying to this render. So this render only affects those pieces. Now, what, um, Scared me for a second. I was like, "Why there are so many points?" <laughs> I thought I didn't pack the geometry. I did pack it. It's just there are a lot of small details. So that's why there's a uh, fifteen hundred different points. So for the um, X, which is the X direction of my ramp, um, I remap the X from frame one to frame 300 to zero to one because I want to sample um, this ramp in a zero to one range and this is representing frame one essentially and frame 300 over here. Then uh, it's pretty straightforward. My p-scale just multiply against the evaluation result of this ramp. So this is 100% p-scale then it re reduced to 50% uh, and it carries on from there. 
Uh, the reason you can't see it here because the PC attribute doesn't automatically update the viewport if you have pad pieces. So what I did, I split out that piece, um, essentially pick the center of um, of the piece before it's unpacked. Then I unpack it. Then I have all the raw points to work with. Then I set the piece scale as um, as a relative distance to the center of my original um, piece. And if you look at this branch, they, they shrink. So, still the shrinking. So that. So I shrink it to I shrunk it to like fifty percent, and it's it's good enough. It's less distracting. And also the shrinking itself is not uh, noticeable because I don't want the shrinking animation to be uh, super noticeable then it will become distracting in a different way. Okay, this is done, ready for export through our vertex animation. There's also another branch here which I'm not going to really talk about but this branch is used to um, generate this inside crack. This is pretty much just um, processed from the inside faces of my destruction and I can I can insert this as a static mesh with um, like a glowing look and put it inside my um, transparent geometry so in the final iteration we didn't use this that's why um, I'm just gonna skip this part so let's talk about vertex animation export in um, the next video